Allow me to introduce myself. I am Bishop Archduke Dr. Robert L. Maxwell of the Prophetic Royal Coat of Arms Ministry, Duke of Pomerania and Livonia, Colonel of the Royal Guard of Pomerania and Livonia, Field Marshal of the Prophetic Royal Coat of Arms Ministry, and Knight of the Sacred and Military Order of Merits of the Prophetic Royal Coat of Arms Ministry. Today we are going to conclude our study in Amos. Today we're going to be looking at Amos chapter 9, concluding our study of the book of Amos. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and uh, we ask that you would heal us mentally, physically, spiritually. We repent of our sins and ask you to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Anoint us, empower us, move us into the apostolic and the prophetic. Open our hearts, hearts and minds to your truth, your word, your will, your purpose for our lives. Make my preaching and teaching acceptable to you. And grant us that word of wisdom and knowledge. We ask this in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amos 9, colon 1, dash 15, then I saw a vision of the Lord standing beside the altar. He said, strike the tops of the temple columns so hard that the foundation will shake. Smash the columns so the roof will crash down on the people below. Then those who survive will be slaughtered in battle. No one will escape to even if they dig down to the place of the dead, I will reach down and pull them up. Even if they climb up into the heavens, I will bring them down. Three, even if they hide at the very top of Mount Carmel, I will search the mountain and catch them. Even if they hide at the bottom of the ocean, I will send the great sea serpent after them to bite and destroy them. For even if they are driven into exile, I will command the sword to kill them there. I am determined to bring disaster upon them and not to help them. Five, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, touches the land and it melts, and all its people mourn. The ground rises like the Nile River at flood time, and then it sinks again. Six, the upper stories of the Lord's home are in the heavens, while its foundation lies on the earth. He draws up water from the oceans, and pours it down as rain on the land. The Lord is his name. Seven you Israelites think you are more important to me than the Ethiopians, asks the Lord. I brought you out of Egypt, but have I not done as much for other nations too? I brought the Philistines from Crete, and led the Aramians out of Kerr, Ati, the sovereign Lord, am watching this sinful nation of Israel, and I will uproot it, and scatter its people across the earth. Yet I have promised that I will never completely destroy the family of Israel, says the Lord. Nine, for I have commanded that Israel be persecuted by the other nations as grain is sifted in a sieve. Yet not one true kernel will be lost. Ten, but all the sinners will die by the sword, all those who say, nothing bad will happen to us. Eleven, in that day I will restore the fallen kingdom of David. It is now like a house in ruins, but I will rebuild its walls and restore its former glory. Twelve and Israel will possess what is left of Edom, and all the nations I have called to be mine. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do these things. Thirteen, the time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Then the fairest vineyards on the hills of Israel will reap with sweet wine. Fourteen, I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands, and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again. 
They will plant vineyards and gardens. They will eat their crops and drink their wine. Fifteen, I will firmly plant them there in the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Then they will never be uprooted again. <clears throat> that was read out of the New Living. Today we're going to use the NSB today. And let us take a look at Amos chapter 9 verses 1 through 4. And it reads, I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Smite the capitals, so that the threshold will shake and break them on the heads of them all that then I will slay the rest of them with the sword they will not have they will not have a fugitive who will flee or a refuge a refugee who will escape though they dig into shoal from there will the, my hand take them from there will my hand take them and though they send to heaven from there I will bring them down though they hide on the summit of Carmel I will search them out and take them from there and though they conceal themselves from my sight on the from my sight on the floor of the sea from there I will command the serpent and it will bite them though they go into captivity before their enemies from there I will command the sword that it slay them and I will not and I will set my eyes against them for evil and not for good uh, Amos chapter 9 verse 1 I saw the Lord God is now poised on earth beside the altar God is about to initiate the destruction from the very place from which the people expected to hear a word of peace and blessing capitals God will shatter the temple completely from the from the decorated capitals down to the heaviest stone threshold the next line depicts the destruction whether the next line depicts the destruction a vision of the destruction of the places of worship at Bethel Verses 9 through, tw uh, verse, uh, Amos chapter 9, verses 2 through 4. These verses emphasize the impossibility of escaping from God's impending judgment, the imagery, the imagery. Extremes to which a person might go may be compared with those in Psalm 137 verses 7 through 12. 
God's dominion includes every place, even the realm of the grave. And this word shul is the same place as Hades in the New Testament. Amos 9, verse 3, the summit of Carmel. Serpent in pagan mythology, the fierce monster of the sea. If someone should seek to escape by hiding in the depths, he could still not evade God, for even there all are subject to him. <clears throat> and of course, verse 4, before their enemies I command, I will command, even those dispersed among the nations will not escape God's judgment. Now, this the book of Amos is written to the house of Israel and God is going to bring judgment upon the house of Israel through their Caesarean captivity. This chapter, as all the other chapters, points forward to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. and the temple in 70 A.D. and the scattering of the house of Judah, the remnant. So what do we see in verses 1 through 4? We see that God is going to Punish the house of Israel. And destroy their false places of worship. And their false places of worship are going to collapse on top of them. And that there's going to be no escape from God's judgment upon them. God is going to destroy the house of Israel. Now, when I say God is going to destroy the house of Israel, we must contextualize what's being said. God's going to wipe out the majority or a good portion of the house of Israel. There's going to be a remnant that survives. In the period of time in the A.D. destruction of Jerusalem Temple, 
90% of the Jews were wiped out during that time in the first century. Not all of them. He had a 10% that survived, that were scattered. And so, in this passage of scripture, we're going to see a good portion of the house of Israel is going to be wiped out. But there's going to be a remnant survives. And always, that remnant is going to begin to flourish again. Now when I say that 90% of the Jews were wiped out in the first three centuries of destruction of Jerusalem the temple, that does not include the Jews. That doesn't include the descendants of Zedekiah. It doesn't include the Jews that escape captivity of first part of the Egyptian captivity and right before or after or right before Moses delivering the Israelites from Egypt, those who escaped then. And brothers and sisters, there is no escape. Of God, escape from God's coming judgment, white throne judgment. Everyone, the good, the bad, and the ugly, are going to get what's coming to them. The good, the bad, and the ugly. It's punishment for the unsaved and payday for the saved. God is going to bring down bring down The false places and worships, the false worships and the false places of worship is going to bring down the false churches and the false teaching and preaching and teaching and evangelism is going to bring down the idol religions in this world because there's a lot of places that have on their building the name church a lot of Buildings that have signs next to the buildings that says church. But that just because your building or your sign says church does not mean that you are a church. If you are teaching false doctrine, false theology in your building, in your church. God is going to bring down your church, bring down your building, bring down your signs. 
if you're teaching in your church building. Theistic evolution. God is going to bring down your church if you're teaching evolution. Atheist, uh, philosophical naturalism. And if your church is explaining away all the miracles written in Scripture, liken them to mere natural causes. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, God is going to bring your church down. God is going to tear down your church, destroy your church, destroy your signs. And not one of your members is going to escape the day, the great white throne day of judgment. Because when everything is said and done, you're going to be classified in two classifications, either in Christ or not. And if you're not in Christ, then you're not going to be with Christ. Your worship places of Islam, your worship places of Hinduism, your worship places of Buddhism, God is bringing, going to bring them down, bring them low. And when everything is said and done, you're either in the true church or you're in the false church. If you're not in Christ, then you belong to the false church. You belong to the false church. Church, you belong to the Antichrist Church. You belong to the Church of Satan. You belong to the Church of the Devil. Because you're either in the real church or you're in the false church. And if you're not in Christ, then you're not in the real church. But if you're in the in Christ, then you're a part of the real church. And any church that is not in Christ, that is not in Christ, is going to be destroyed and brought down low. You either belong to the Antichrist Church or you belong to the real Christ Church. Because there is only one God, one church, one way, and His name is Jesus Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're either a part of the real church or you're a part of the false church. It doesn't matter how religious your church is. It doesn't matter how many rituals and ceremonies that take place in your church. If it's not in Christ, then it's not a part of the real church. It doesn't matter how religious or how spiritual your church is. If it's not in Christ, then it's a false church and therefore it will not stand. It will be destroyed and brought down. It doesn't matter if 
Your church has a laughing movement going on. It doesn't matter. If there's a bunch of slaying in the spirit, a bunch of dancing and clapping and, and shouting, if it doesn't, if it's not in Christ, then it is not of Christ and therefore it will not stand because only God's church will stand. None other can be elevated to the status of divinity. His name is Jesus. It doesn't matter. If the preaching is loud and obnoxious, it doesn't matter if the preaching is good preaching and teaching. If it's not in Christ, it does not belong to the real church and therefore it will not stand. Because only the real church will stand. The one and only church. The church of the Bible. The God of the Bible. Those that teach this word. It may even appear that your church is anointed. It may have all the accolades of what a true church should look like and act like and behave. If your church is ordaining homosexuals, it doesn't belong to the true church. Because my word, this word says that homosexual is an abomination to God. It is either a church that has a real faith or a said faith. And if your church has a said faith, then it does not belong to the true faith, the true church, the true church of God. It's either real or not. There's no in-between. Because in order for your church to be of the true church, it must teach what Philadelphia and Smyrnoff taught. What did Philadelphia and Smyrnoff talk, teach in Revelation chapter 2 and 3? They taught about those who claim to be of our brother Judah, but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. Because at the end of the day, it only matters what context, content that your church teaches. And if your church is not teaching about teaching the context of what Philadelphia and Smyrnoff taught, it does not belong to the true church. And it, and if my memory is correct, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and 4, there was only two churches that God approved of, and that's Philadelphia and Smyrna. Why? Because they taught, they taught about those who claim to be of our brother Judah, but lie, do lie, and are of the synagogue of Satan. Because unbelievers took over the leadership in the first three centuries 
They had said face rather than real face. And they were not of the true church of God. They were the Kenites, the descendant, descendants that Satan used to afford God's plan and purpose. Try to and try to afford, uh, afford uh, to try to afford God's purpose and plan, bringing forth the sea line of Christ, umbilicord to umbilicord to umbilicord. Let's take a look at verse five through six. The Lord God of hosts. The one who touches the land so that it melts, and all those who dwell in it mourn, and all of it rises up like the Nile, and subsides like the Nile of Egypt. The one who builds his upper chambers is in the heavens, and has Founded his his vaulted doom over the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. The Lord, verse 5, the Lord who introduces a hymnetic reminder that, that Israel's God is the creator and sustainer of the universe, thus underlining the pronouncements of the previous verses. His upper chambers contrast the scale of God with the scale of man whose structures fall at the moment, at, at the movement of the earth. God is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. He is the first cause, uncaused. There is only one God. There is only one way to heaven. And there is only one God that be worshipped under heaven and earth. No other. Because the fact of the reality is If your church is not built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, then you belong to a false church, you belong to the false Christ church, you belong to the antichrist church, and that church Whatever church it may be, will not stand, it will be destroyed, and those who worship the gods and idols of whatever church that you belong to, if it doesn't teach the essential doctrines of the Christian faith, 
If your church is not built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Jesus Christ is a cornerstone, you belong to the synagogue of Satan. You belong to the church of the devil. I don't care what you call it, how you call it, if you call yourself a Jehovah's Witness, whether you call yourself a Mormon, whether you call yourself a Muslim, if you don't worship the God of the Bible, you belong to a false church and your church will not stand, your church will be destroyed, your church will be brought down, brought low on the day of the great white throne judgment because at the end of the day, after everything is said and done, there's only going to be one church that stands, and that's the church of God, the church of the Bible, the God of the Bible. Take a look at verses 7 through 10. Are you not as the sons of Ethiopian to me? Ethiopians, these are descendants from the sixth day creation, Goy, the nations, ethnoses, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord, have I not brought up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftar and the Our means from Kerr, behold, the eyes of the Lord are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Nevertheless, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For behold, I am commanding, and I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations, as a grain is shaken in a but not a kernel will fall to the ground all the sinners of my people will die by the sword those who say calamity will not overtake or confront us So, the sons of Ethiopia are descendants from the sixth day who live south of Egypt, probably in the upper Nile region. Have I brought Israel? Israel could not rely on God's past blessings as an assurance of, it, of his future bedlamment. Here stubborn rebellious, rebelliousness robbed the exodus of all special meaning for her. Her journey from Egypt is, is reduced to no more mere significance than the movement of other people's sinful uh, verse 8 sinful kingdom Israel the chosen who disobeyed was far worse than the sins of other nations sees separation from the weak from small stones and other Refused, gathered with it when scoped up from the ground. All sinners will die, verse 10, for their persistent rebellion. This verse is also regarded as messianic in the Jewish tumult 
I will rise up, raise, uh, raise uh, hope underlying Amos' words. One that runs through the whole, one that runs through the whole of Old Testament from Genesis on, God will bring blessings after judgment and will not ultimately reject Israel. Booth literally means hut or rough boot, either the dynasty houses of David or the United Kingdoms of the twelve tribe, uh, twelve tribes of David's kingdom. The word hut may have been chosen to recall David's humbling blessings, as in the days of old, in the days of King Solomon. Verse 11, in that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David and will, and wall it up, wall up its breaches and I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it in the days of old. Although it may look dark, and gloomy to this to the house of Israel, there is a glimmer, a glittering of hope. God is going to put the two sticks back together, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and raise it up to its glory again. God is going to punish, destroy the good, the bad, the ugly. Everyone is going to get what's coming to them. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But... It is not the end of the world, yet there is a glimmering hope during this period of grace. God is going to punish, destroy the false religions, the false churches, and everyone is going to get what's coming to them. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But it's not the end of the world. Because there is a glimmering hope. Because no matter what kind of church you belong to, whether Jew, whether Jehovah's Witness, whether Mormon, Muslim, or some liberal church all you got to do is repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and then you can be a part of the church that is going to rise and not the church that is going to fall, collapse. You can either belong to the church that's not going to collapse, or the church that is going to collapse. Verse 11 through 13. 
In that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches and I will, ra will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the, old, in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Eden and all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does it. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes and the and the treader of grapes him who, who sows seed, when the mountains will drip sweet wine, and all the hills will be dissolved. Now, Eden here refers to descendants of Esau, which is the Russian people of modern day society, the Russian nation. Verse 12, the remnant of Eden, what? Ever is left of Israel's bitter enemies after her punishment all the nations who are called by my name refers to the extent of the rule of the Lord's anointed future king recalling that David had reigned over many nations surrounding Israel represents the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant the the Messiah will reign will reign even over former enemies of whom is Eden symbolic who does this God does what he says Take a look at verses 14 and 15. And also, I will restore the captivity of my people of Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. And they will also plant vineyards and drink their wine, and will make gardens and eat their fruits. Fruit, and I will also plant them on their land, and they will not again be uprooted out from their land which I have given them says the Lord your God verses 13 through 15 after the forecast of destruction death dearth and death Amos final words pictures a glory a glorious Eden prosperity when the seasons will run together so that sowing and reaping are without intervals and there will be a continuous supply of fresh fruit a reversal of the condition portrayed in verses 4 through 11 I will restore will restore they will rebuild they will also plant I will also plant in the promised land God will make his people productive fruitful and secure rebuild the ruins not again when Israel is finally and fully restored she will never again be destroyed and so what do we got here in these verses verses 11 through 
15, we have the millennial period of time when the two sticks are put back together, the house of Israel and the house of Judah put back together. In the slow, gradual process of Christianizing the whole entire world, ushering a golden age of peace and prosperity. The Gentiles the house of Judah and the house of Israel will be made one kingdom, one empire, a new kingdom, a new Israel, paradise lost becoming paradise restored and the problem of sin and death fully and finally resolved. Although there will be periods of progression and recession for the church, but consequently will lose some souls to hell, but in the end there will be more people saved than not. And so we see the fortunes and the blessings restored back to Israel once again. And those who have believed and accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, whether you're of the house of Judah or Israel or the Gentiles are the elect, the remnant of Israel are the spiritual children of Abraham because if you're a Gentile a descendant of the sixth day creation and you believe and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior you are you become an Israelite because God is not a racist. Although it is true that in the Old Testament there were prohibitions against interracial marriage and mixing. And descendants of a mixed mixed uh, mixed relations were not able to participate in the king line of the twelve tribes of Israel until several generations down several generations down And there was that prohibition against interracial marriage and mixing in the Old Testament. But it had nothing to do with God necessarily being a racist. It had more to do with that prohibition against mixing was a type and shadow of Christ who Christ comes along and fulfills the types and shadows of the Old Testament that prohibition against interracial marriage and mixing had to do with the ceremonial aspect the ceremonial law had nothing to do with the moral or civil law but it had more to do with the ceremonial aspect of the law but Christ came along and fulfilled the ceremonial law 
And therefore, there is no longer any prohibition against interracial mixing. Because the reason why God told them to do it, because it was a type of being set apart, a type of holiness, being a set apart. That's, uh, it, the prohibition against mixing was a type of uh, being ceremonially righteous, set apart for God's purpose and plan. It was a type. And Christ fulfilled the types and shadows of the Old Testament. And so since Christ has came along, he's fulfilled the ceremonial aspect of the law. And so there is no longer prohibition against interracial mixing today. Because there is no longer any distinction between Jew, Gentile, Greek, slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ. Because the gospel has been open to the whole entire world. But the only reason why there's prohibition in the Old Testament had to do with... Uh, ceremonial cleanliness God has broken down the barrier between the Jew and the Gentile and Christ has bridged the gap and those who are in Christ were all one in Christ and heirs according to the promise spiritual descendants of Abraham it may look gloomy right now but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Conclusion. Amos chapter 9 verse 1. Judgment would begin at the altar, the center of the nation's life. The place where the people expected protection and blessings. This judgment would cover all. Of the, of the house of Israel. Not. It's not. This chapter is not. Uh, this book is not speaking to the house. Of Judah. Although. And I should. Let me put it more. Put it this way. This. Uh, Amos. The book of Amos. Is not. Written to the house. Of Judah. It is written for the house of Judah, but it's not written to the house of Judah. It is written to the house, written to the house of Israel, and written for the house of Judah and for you and I today, descendants. Of those houses. Commentators disagree concerning this altar. Some think it was the altar of Bethel. Um, others think it's the altar in the temple of Jerusalem, but it's not, it's the altar of Bethel. So God would destroy their base of security in order to bring them to himself. In verse 9-11, God, he promises to restore his renewed people and their broken world.
Sheol was a place of the dead, which of course was Hades in the Old Testament, same place. Hades, Sheol is Hades. Sheol is the Hebrew word for Hades, and Hades is the Greek word for Sheol. And Carmel is, uh, Carmel is a mountain, both were symbolic of in inaccessibility. No one can escape God's judgment. This was good news for the faithful, but bad news for the unfaithful. Whether we go to the mountain top or the bottom of the sea, God will find us and judge us for our deeds. Amos Amos, Amos pictured this judgment of the wicked as a monster of the sea, relentlessly pursuing the condemned. For God's faithful followers, however, the judgment brings a new earth, a peace and prosperity. Does God, uh, God, does God ju judgment sound like good news or bad news to you? Ethiopia was south of uh, Egypt, was a remote to the land of the Israelites. Kaftars in the island of Crete where the Philistines lived as they migrated to Palestine. God would judge Israel no, in, uh, no differently, differently than he judged foreign nations. He is not the God of Israel only, but he is the God of the universe and he is, c controls all nations. Amos assures the Israelites that God would not totally destroy the Israelites. In other words, the punishment would not be permanently or total. God wants to redeem, not punish. But when punishment is necessary, He, does, he doesn't withhold it. Like a loving father, God disciplines those He loves in order to correct them. If, God's, if God disciplines you, accept it as a sign of his love. Although Assyria would destroy Israel and take the people into exile, some would be preserved. This exile had been predicted hundreds of years earlier in Deuteronomy 28, 63-68. Although the nation would be purified, through the invasion and captivity, not one true believer would be eternally lost. Our system of justice is not always perfect, but, but God is. Sinners will not get away, and the faithful will not be forgotten. True believers will not be lost. In the punishment, the house of David was reduced to a fallen booth tent. God's covenant with David stated that one of David's descendants would always sit on his throne, that being Jesus Christ. The exile made this promise seem impossible, but in that day God would rise up and restore the kingdom to to its promised glory. This pr promise, this was a promise to both the house of Israel and Judah not to be fulfilled by an earthly or political ruler but by the Messiah who would renew the spiritual kingdom and rule forever. 
James quotes this verse, Acts 15, 16 through 17, finding the promised fulfillment in Christ's resurrection and in the presence of both the house of Israel, Judah, and the Gentiles in the church possess the remnant of Eden envisions the messianic kingdom which will be a universal and include Gentiles when God brings the Gentiles when God brings in the Gentiles he is restoring the ruin after the Gentiles are called together God will renew and restore the fortunes of the new Israel and all the land that was once under David's rule will be a part of God's nation. Verse 13, this verse describes a time of such abundance of crops that the people won't be able to harvest them all. The house of Israel of Amos' day had lost sight of God's care and love for them. The, the rich were carefree and comfortable, refusing to help others in need. They observed their religious rituals in hope of appeasing God, but they did not truly love Him. Amos announces God announces God's warning of destruction for their evil ways we must not assume that going to church and being good is enough God expects our belief in him to penetrate all areas of our life and conduct and to extend to all people circumstance extend to all people and circumstances we should let Amos's words inspire us to live faithfully according to God's desire and that concludes the book of Amos let's pray dear me dear Yahweh Atalai Elohim we ask you to hide these words in our hearts and minds and empower us to put into practice these truths in Christ Jesus name we pray through the power of the Holy Ghost Amen God bless